Did you come tonight expecting more than dinner and to make a pledge? Because if you aren't, I want you to stretch out your tent peg and expect him to speak to you in a powerful way. I believe tonight is a life-shaping, life-changing night for every single person in this room. That's what I've prayed. That's what I've asked for. And if you believe it, you can receive it tonight. Um, my story is, um, as a young teenager, I didn't know who I was. I was in church. I had given my life to Jesus. But I did not know who I was as an individual. I didn't know. Um, I just didn't know a lot of anything. I had fun. Um, but I just didn't have any identity. And so I chose the party route and wanted to fit in. And um, that led me to have um, three abortions. I got pregnant three times and chose to abort each time. And uh, with each abortion, abortion, you lose a part of yourself. You lose a part of um, who you are. And um, I went through a lot of guilt and shame and condemnation. It's really only been the last seven years that um, I've been free enough to be able to share my testimony with people. And uh, I don't know if you meet people in Starbucks for coffee and they kind of dump their problems on you. Or maybe you're, you're the one that goes and you dump problems on your friend at Starbucks. But um, in a little coffee shop, open door Bible store, bookstore, um, I met Kim Lewis and Cindy Smith. And uh, Paula Best was introducing me to them. And um, I really felt like God wanted me to write a book about my story. There is no book, so don't go on Amazon. You can put your iPhones and your iPads down. But... Um, the story, it took a while for the story to finish up and the healing process to finish up. So who knows what God has in store for that. But Paula introduced me to these ladies and they were like, well, do you have your family support? And um, I had been married for many years and I had two small children. And I said, well, my parents don't know. I made this decision without them knowing anything. I hid it. I went in under an assumed name and took cash. And um, the fathers were very much a part of the process. And um, they said, well, really, to move forward, you really need to, to talk to your parents. Well, I don't know about y'all, but that's not really anything I wanted to share with anybody, you know, much less to me standing up here um, many years later. But... Um, I just kind of tucked that away and I thought they didn't say that, you know, God can use me here and there and whatever, but um, this big dark cloud just stayed over me the whole time. And um, out of Psalms 32, it says, when I kept silent or was in secret, my bones wasted away with groanings all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave me the guilt of my sin. See, I had repented and I knew that Jesus had forgiven me. But one thing that a woman who's had an abortion, she cannot forgive herself. And I walk in such shame and guilt and condemnation, even though he says that he takes our sin and removes them as far as the east is from the west. I still was just like, I had to beat myself up. I had to punish myself. I wasn't worthy. And um, when I did get married, I would not wear a white wedding dress. I wore a blush pink because I didn't feel worthy to wear a white wedding dress. I... Um, would not take clothes to the dry cleaners because I did not feel worthy for someone to clean my filthy garments. And so, I mean, the torment went on, even though 
that God had forgiven me, but little by little, the Lord would put people in my path to speak life into me, or maybe they had had an abortion, and um, God had healed them, and they were, you know, walking in a good place, and, and it just really gave me hope, and for one thing, um, breaking the silence is the first step. If you can ever come out of your mouth and say to a good friend or someone you trust that i done this, I made this choice. Um, he will rush people to their side to bring life and hope and to bring liberty to them. And it's been amazing. I've seen it over and over and over. Um, so I get married and I have my life what I thought looked like it was put together. We had a nice car that was four doors and we had a home that we had just built. And um, I desired children at this point. And uh, we had been married for almost 10 years when Emily was born. And uh, what a blessing that she is to me. And then several years later, we had, um, we had Evan. But back up, I missed something. After desiring children for a long time, um, I got pregnant about um, two and a half years before I got pregnant with Emily. And that baby lost its heartbeat. And so I have to have a DNC for them to remove the child. At the same weeks that I had aborted the previous three. And I thought, God, you're punishing me. I, I deserve this, okay? I may never be able to have children. I've done so much damage to my body. How could I possibly get pregnant and carry it? And God did grace me to be able to have Emily and... Um, and Evan. And so life goes on and things are good. You know, you got your little boy and your little girl and your four door car and, you know, you're pulling up in your little brick house and everything looks good. And um, things in your whole life begin to change. Um, your relationship with your spouse is strained. Um, work, travel schedule, business appointments, things like that. And uh, my husband and I just grew apart. And so, um, about five years ago, I found out that his mistress was expecting his baby. And it was going to be due around our 20-year wedding anniversary. Well, that's not exactly what you want as a gift. But you know, in my heart, I stood in my bedroom and I said, every day of that child's life is known before one day begins. That's what the Word says, and my God doesn't lie. And so I began to make room in my heart to pray for this child with hopes that um, the child would come and be with us and God would restore our marriage. But that wasn't the case. And I'm okay with that now. And I'm sorry that this is emotional. But um, God is so good and He's so faithful that in the midst of it all, He was there for me. I knew Him before. I have walked with Him and saw his face, but I know him in a way now that no one can take from me. No one can take from me how I know him. In the dark place, in the dark night of the soul, who do you call on? Do you call on him when things are good? Or do you call on him when things are going just bad? Because we need to, to seek his face continually. Or we will miss opportunities that He has for us. You know, I never dreamt that I would be standing on a stage tonight. I just wanted to be able to share with somebody my story so I could prevent a teenager from making the same choice that I made. And He's used me with youth groups to, to really speak the Word into them for their identity, for them to know who they are and who God created him, them to be. And I want to impart that to this generation. You know, we may never see Roe versus Wade overturned. I would love for it to be, and I pray for it to be. And even held a sign the other day, walking two miles for Paul in pregnancy, that said, pray to end abortion. And that is my heart. But in this hour, the most important people in this game is the church. If the church will rise up and embrace the women and the men who have had abortion, their children have, you know, God provided for them. Those babies are in heaven. Glory to God. And it's time for the 
church to reach in and touch those women and those men if they'll trust us. We've got to build that relationship with us. My heart is that He would make us, Deuteronomy 111, make our voice a thousand times greater. That my voice tonight up here would be echoed through the earth a thousand times greater than it is if the women would just come forward and the men come forward and receive their healing. And you as a church can be part of that. You can be part of that. You never know when you're going to be caught off guard or by surprise. And you just love them. The one thing that I love about the center is their heart is so huge. You know, I was talking to somebody tonight and I said, love is stronger than death. He conquered it all. And if we have the love of Jesus in our heart, we can support the center with our finances. But our prayer support, they're on the front lines every single day standing for life and they take hits. And my heart is for every prayer, uh, pregnancy center in our nation to have a prayer strategy where they have a core group of intercessors to pray, to cover them, to pray into the plans and the purposes that God has for every one of these sinners. And He does have a plan for it. It's His will. And I'm grateful that a lot of abortion clinics have closed. A lot of them have. And as we see pregnancy centers rise up, we're seeing the church rise up because the church is the one at the forefront with them in their support. And I'm so grateful for that. And um, a couple of years ago, I heard Carol Everett speak, and she was a lady who was an abortionist out of Texas. And she threw a business opportunity and wanting to advance herself um, found herself just repeating the sinner's prayer just to get this Christian dude off her back. And when she said it, she didn't believe it. She's like, I'm good. I'm going to get my clinic. But he kept saying, no, God has sent me to pull somebody out of this business. She's like, yeah, I know who they are. They get on my nerves. And um, they're like, no way. So anyway, um, she said the next day when she began unlocking the door that she saw with eyes that she had never seen before. And that day she had talked three women out of abortion. And she said, I don't do that because I made 25 bucks off of every abortion. You know, and she told me some things that really just made me mad about Planned Parenthood. And she said, um, when a young girl calls into Planned Parenthood, they never mention the baby. They say, well, honey, you're so-and-so weeks pregnant. You need to get in here. And they have a script, just like a telemarketer does, to overcome every objection. She said that they also would give faulty contraception, low-grade condoms, and they would give the lowest dose birth control pills so that their services would be needed. Their goal was for every set of 14 to 17 year old female to have a minimum of one abortion up to three. And after she spoke, I went up to her and I said, I had three abortions. She said, well, God's forgiven you. God's healed you. It's time to get to work. Fast forward into the next year at this particular um, pregnancy banquet, and I got the privilege to hear Gianna Jessen. And if you don't know who she is, she survived a saline abortion. And because of the time she was born, a physician was not in the clinic, and her life was spared. And when I left this particular night, I just... Um, the whole way home, it was a 45-minute drive, and I had the radio turned off. And I just felt the brooding of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you have ever felt that. But I pray that every single one of you feel that brooding. There was a weight of His presence. I was fearful. And I said, God, with tears streaming down my face, I said, I don't know what you're doing. But I say yes. As bad as it scares me, 
I say yes. And so, a few weeks after that, the Lord had put it on my heart to talk to Marilyn about building a prayer strategy for the center, um, to write it plain upon tablets, as Habakkuk says. And it was weeks before we ever got in touch, and through that time, um, the Lord had really spoke a huge word over my life about how I would represent Him in our nation. That's no little thing. <laughs> I live in Canton. I go to Carter Small. We're talking nation. You're scaring me, God. And But I said, whatever you want. You told me to go, and, and I'll go wherever you open the door. And so on July 3rd, a year ago, Marilyn called me, and she said, I've got to talk to you. Kim Lewis is coming to the center. And if Kim is coming here, God is about to do extraordinary things. And I said, well, that's funny because I've got something that I want to share, so I want to meet with you guys. And so um, just before September, I went over and talked to them and told them that, you know, we got to do this in prayer. If it's not done in prayer, it'll never stand. It'll never hold. It makes the way. It paves the way. And so um, just like tonight, they were talking about the land of Kingston. When land has been defiled by blood, bloodshed, whether it's innocent blood or not innocent blood, the ground cries out. And our nation, the shape that we're in, is because of the innocent blood that has been poured into the earth that is crying out. And I just happen to be one of those ones that will weep between the porch and the altar for those babies. So when I met with them, we set up the time that the last Tuesday of every month that I would come over and pray. And there's been times that strategically, I just geographically could not get there. And so we've done it on the phone and, and I'll call and that kind of thing. So that started last September. And so right after the banquet last year, I um, met with Paula Best and she and I were praying, and I said, you know, whoever is going to be on stage next year, we need to begin to pray that God puts them there, and they have a righteous indignation for life, and they will just get the people so angry and mad at the enemy who has just been allowed. We've sat back as a church and a nation and just let him run amok. And it's time for us to stand up through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we may not can take on the nation, but we can take on our city, our neighborhood, whatever your sphere of influence is. And so um, we went on the prayer retreat in February, and it was just so God from the very moment we got there. And the Lord kept, we kept seeing those signs up through Dalton, um, and all the exit words, 333, 333, 333, and I'm a numbers girl. I love numbers, and I love digging it out in Scripture. And yes, I have one for tonight, too. But um, when we got to the hotel room, guess what my room number was? 333. And when I sat down in, in Marilyn's room and we began praying over everything, um, it was like in an instant. The prophetic words I had received, the things God had spoken to me, the encouragement I had received from other people. It was just like God just cinched it all in a moment as a garment for me to wear. And um, it was just it was just an awesome time. So the 333 is Jeremiah 333. Come unto me. And I will show you great and mighty things, things that are hidden, things that are fenced in, things that only His Holy Spirit can show us. And He wants to reveal secrets to every single person here tonight. He wants to speak tenderly to every part of your being, to your physical body, to your mind, to your finances, to your business, the platform He has for you. And he has something for every single person here. It's not just me or, or Barry or Marilyn. It is for everybody here. I mean, he's got something unique that he created you for. And I believe in my heart that 
because your, the word says that every day of your life is known before one day begin. I believe when you were a spirit in heaven, oh, you did know your spirit, right? You're not human trying to be spiritual. You were spirit first. And this is kind of like your earth suit. But you came with everything you need for the journey. You are packed from heaven with everything you have need of. And as you get around people who are walking in the anointing of God, they pull that good out of you. They encourage you in those areas. And so I encourage you to ask Him for the mysteries to show me the hidden things. And you have your own little journey with Him. And out of that, I mean, this up here tonight is just flown out of my personal time with Him. There is nothing that I can ever do that's not birthed in that quiet place with Him. So I encourage you to build the secret place. I encourage you to say, God, what is my part in this? Not just financially, but what do you want? And I ask Him a lot of questions a lot of times. And a lot of times, as an intercessor, you will start feeling what is going on with other people, their emotions, what's going on with them physically, and you're able to release healing and pray for them. But there was one time I got really sad, and I said, God, I don't have any reason to be sad. Why do I feel this way? And he said, if you don't pray, Babies will die tomorrow. That's pretty heavy. But it's a responsibility that he's called me to. And so I just encourage you to ask him, what do you want from me? What can I do for you? How can I serve you? I so appreciate your attention tonight and your grace to be able to share who I am. Love me or don't love me, it's okay. I'm over that. <laughs> but the scripture that I did get in the date of today is 1016. And I was worried because so many people in here have heard my story. And I was worried that it just fall on deaf ears. He said, if they reject you, they reject me. And they reject the one that sent me. And that's in Luke 10, 16. I'm so grateful to be part of what God's doing here. What he's doing in the lives of the people in Bartow County. There's been huge prophetic words spoken over this city and over this county. And just because I live in Canton, I carry Bartow County in my heart really, really big. I've made so many relationships and friendships here. Life is nothing without friends and relationships with your family and people who love you and care about you. And I just bless you tonight. And I appreciate the, you loving me right where I'm at. Bless you.